Good morning, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. My name is JC. I am 11 years old and I come from China. This is my second year at the meeting. Mr. Munger, it's great to see you again after the Daily Journal meeting in February. Mr. Buffett, you mentioned that the older you get, the more you understood about human nature. Could you elaborate more about what you've learned? And how can the differences of human nature help you make a better investment? I would also like Mr. Munger to comment on that, please. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> well, you should wait for Charlie's answer because he's even older. <laughs> he can tell you more about being old than I can even. The, uh, it's absolutely true that that uh, virtually any, any uh, yardstick you use, I'm going downhill. Uh, and the, you know, if I would take a SAT test now and you could compare it to a score of when I was in my early 20s, I, I think it'd be quite embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> and it's certainly, Charlie and I can give you a lot of examples and there's others we won't tell you about uh, how things decline as you get older. But I would, I would say this, it's absolutely true in my view that, that uh, you can and should understand human behavior better as you do get older. You just have more experience with it. And I don't think you can read, Charlie and I read every book we could on every subject we were interested in, you know, when we were very young. And we learned a, an enormous amount just from what a, from other studying the lives of other of other people. And but I don't think you can really I don't think uh, you can get to be an expert on human behavior at all uh, by reading books, no matter what your IQ is, no matter who the teacher is. And uh, I think that you really do learn a lot about human behavior. Sometimes you have to learn it by having multiple experiences. Um, I think you, I think, I actually think I, despite all the other shortcomings, and I can't do mental arithmetic as fast as I used to, and I can't, can't read as fast as I used to, but I, I do think that I know a lot more about human behavior than I did when I was 25 you, or 30. If you want one mantra, it comes from a Chinese gentleman who just died, Li Kuan Yu, who was the greatest nation builder probably that ever lived in the history of the world. And he said one thing over and over and over again all his life, figure out what works and do it. You just go at life with that simple philosophy from your own national group, you will find it works wonderfully well. Figure out what works and do it. And figuring out what works means figuring out how other people of course. behave. Of course. And, and Charlie and I have seen the extremes in human behavior and uh, in so many unexpected ways. And that's, Now we get it every night. Yeah. Extremes so, of human behavior. Yeah. All we gotta do is turn on the television. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to use that example. <laughs> My name is Carrie, and this is my daughter, Chloe. She's 11 weeks. It's her very first Berkshire meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We're from San Francisco, and we have a question on employment for you. As both a major employer and a producer of consumer goods, what do you make of the uncertain outlook for good full-time jobs with the rise of automation and temporary employment? Well, if we'd asked that question 200 years ago uh, and somebody said, with the outlook for development of farm machinery and tractors and combines and so on, meaning that 90% of the people on farms were going to be lose their job, uh, it would look terrible, wouldn't it? But our economy, and our people, our system, 
has been remarkably ingenious in achieving whatever we have now, 160 million jobs, when throughout the period ever since 1776, we've been figuring out ways to get rid of jobs. That's what capitalism does, and it produces more and more goods per person. And we never know exactly where they're going to come from. I mean, it, it uh, you know, I don't know what you were, if you were, uh, whatever uh, occupation. Well, if you were in the passenger train business, I mean, you know, you were going to, that was going to change. But we find ways in this economy to employ more and more people, and we've got now more people employed than ever in the history of the country, even though company after country and company, and particularly in heavy industry and that sort of thing, has been trying to figure out naturally how to get more productive all the time, which means turning out the same number of goods with fewer people or, or turning out more goods with the same number. That's, that is capitalism. I don't, think, I don't think you need to worry about American ingenuity uh, running out. I mean, I mean you, uh, you look at people in all kinds of, I mean, of businesses and they like to make money they really like to, they like to be inventive you know they like they, they like to do things and uh, and this economy uh, it works it will continue to work and it will be very it's very tough uh, in certain industries and there will be dislocations you know, we won't be making as many horseshoes and that sort of thing when cars come along and all of that but we do find ways now to employ whatever we're employing, 155, whatever it is, million people, and supporting a population of 330 million people. When we started with 4 million people, with 80% of the labor being employed on farms. So this system works and it will continue to work. And I, I don't know what the next big thing will be. <clears throat> I do know there will be a next big thing. Charlie? Well, we want to shift the scut work to the robots to the extent we can. That's what we've been doing, as Warren said, for 200 years. Nobody wants to go back to being a blacksmith or scooping along the street, picking up the horseman or whatever the hell people used to do. Uh, we're glad to have that work eliminated. And a lot of this worry about the future comes from leftists who worry terribly that that uh, the people at the bottom of the economic pyramid have had a little stretch when the people at the top got ahead faster. That happened by accident because we were in so much trouble that we had to flood the world with money and drive interest rates down to zero. And of course that drove asset prices up and helped the rich. Nobody did that because they suddenly loved the rich. It was just an accident and it, it, it will soon pass. Uh, I, we, we want to have all this productivity improvement, and we shouldn't worry a little about the fact that one class or another is a little ahead at one stretch. Charlie, Charlie and I, we worked in a grocery store, and when people ordered the canopies, we had ladders that we climbed up to reach the canopies, and then we placed it in a folding box, and then we put it on a truck. And if you looked at the amount of food actually transferred between the producer and the person who consumed it, and the per and the number of people involved in the transaction, you know, it was, I don't know whether it was one third or one quarter or one fifth as efficient as the way, the best way now to get food delivered to you. And, and, and the food know, was worse. <laughs> and, and my grandfather would, you know, was distressed about the fact that, that, that this particular credit and delivery kind of store would, would be eliminated, and it was eliminated. But society it's coming people. back. It, it's, it's coming back. It's coming back, but more efficiently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we've we've seen a little creative destruction, and and frankly, we're glad that it freed us up to go into the investment business. It worked out better for us. <laughs>